The esophagus is a muscular tube that lies in the midline only in the middle third. The upper and the lower thirds are to the left. The mnemonic is like the march past, left, right, left. Three natural narrowings seen are at the cricopharynx, measuring a maximum of 1.5 cm. At the left bronchus and the aorta, maximum of 1.6 cm. And at the lower esophageal sphincter, measuring a maximum of 1.9 cm. The fun fact about the curvatures and the narrowings are that foreign bodies get impacted here and corrosives cause maximum damage due to a sluggish flow in these areas. The upper extent of the esophagus is the cricoid cartilage or the transverse process of the C6 vertebra. The lower limit is the cardia. During the swallowing, the hyoid bone moves a distance of one vertebral body anterior superiorly over 1.5 seconds to open the retrolaryngeal space. The cervical esophagus is 5 cm in length extending from the transverse process of the C6 vertebra to the first interthoracic disc space. It has striated muscular fibers in continuation with the pharynx. The recurrent laryngeal nerve lies in the tracheoesophageal groove and it is closer to the left than to the right due to the curvature of the esophagus. Injuries of the cervical esophagus could occur intraoperatively during a neck dissection or thyroidectomy and it could also occur because of a stab injury. The thoracic esophagus is 23 to 25 centimeters in length having smooth muscles in the wall and these are arranged in a helical pattern. Therefore, the fun fact is that motility disorders affect the lower two-thirds of the esophagus and myotomy should be done only here. Second of all, the corkscrew pattern is seen during hypertrophy of the helical pattern of the smooth muscles. The thoracic esophagus passes through the hiatus in the diaphragm to become the abdominal esophagus, which is 2 cm in length. The thoracic duct lies just behind the esophagus as it crosses the hiatus. The fascia transversalis bridges the gap between the esophagus and the hiatus. It splits to form two leaves, superior and inferior, between which lies a pad of fat. Lymphatic flow in the esophagus occurs in the submucosal lymphatic plexus. In the upper two-thirds of the esophagus, the flow is mainly upwards and in the lower third of the esophagus, the flow is mainly downwards. If a dye is injected, there is a six times longitudinal spread as opposed to a one time lateral spread. The reason for the erratic spread of carcinoma esophagus is due to the non-segmental lymphatic drainage. The cervical esophagus drains mainly into the deep cervical lymph nodes. The upper thoracic esophagus drains into the paratracheal lymph nodes. The lower thoracic esophagus drains into the subcranial lymph nodes. Whereas the superior gastric lymph nodes receive the lymph both from the abdominal and the lower thoracic lymph nodes. The fun fact is that recurrent laryngeal nerve injury can occur in CA esophagus when there is a spread into the lymph nodes and this predisposes the patient for aspiration. Observe that the esophagus is supplied by many different blood vessels from superior to inferior. The fun facts here are that after a thyroidectomy due to ligation of the inferior thyroid artery, there is no necrosis of the esophagus. Second of all, the esophagus can be mobilized from the stomach all the way till the aorta without any fear of ischemic necrosis. The venous drainage of the esophagus is mainly through the azygous and hemiazygous vein into the IVC. The submucosal venous plexus in the esophagus connects the coronary vein and the short gastric veins to the portal system and superiorly to the azygous system, thus creating a portosystemic shunt which explains how the malignancies can go directly into the liver and also makes us understand how this area gets affected during portal hypertension. The pressure in the esophagus is sub-atmospheric minus 6 mm of mercury, whereas that in the stomach is positive of being plus 6 mm of mercury. The pressure in the upper and lower esophageal sphincters are roughly 30 mm of mercury. During swallowing, the bolus of food has to pass from the atmospheric to the sub-atmospheric pressure getting sucked into, into the esophagus 
and then from the esophagus to the stomach over a pressure gradient of 12 millimeters of mercury. A primary peristaltic wave is initiated by swallowing whereas a secondary peristaltic wave occurs to clear the esophagus. A wave of peristalsis exerts a pressure from 30 to 120 millimeters of mercury. It travels at the rate of 2 to 4 centimeters a second traversing the whole esophagus within 9 seconds. The fun fact is that peristalsis requires a very strong distal anchor. In cases of hiatus hernia, there is a very poor distal anchor and this leads to poor peristalsis. The fun facts are that the worm drive of the esophagus cannot open an LES that fails to relax and this explains motility disorders. A normal pharyngeal swallow initiates an esophageal peristalsis and a relaxation of the LES. A failure of esophageal peristalsis during relaxation of the LES explains GERD. The natural anti-reflux mechanisms are esophageal clearance, LES relaxation and a good gastric reservoir function. The LES is relaxed by food such as caffeine, chocolate, fat and hormones like estrogen and progesterone. It is also relaxed by hormones which tend to cause digestion such as somatostatin, secretin, glucagon. The LES is stimulated by gastrin, motilin, substance P, antacids, cholinergics and proganetics. The take home message is that the arterial, venous and lymphatic anatomy have many clinical implications and motility disorders are caused by the incoordinate actions of the pharynx, sphincters, esophagus and the stomach during the phase of swallowing.